So what I've been asked to talk about is MRI of the wrist and the hand, or well, the wrist particularly, and it's quite a general talk and it's just such a vast topic, isn't it? So I thought what I'd do is, is keep, keep it fairly fast, low level and, 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 and wide reaching. So, you know, we touch a lot of bases. Now we'll have some time for Q&A at the end, hopefully. Um, and this is what I think we ought to cover. Okay, so um, a bit of the bones, a bit of the soft tissues, and a little bit about, start off with, about technique. So how to, not that it's your job to acquire the images, but you know, it's, it is quite helpful to surgeons, I think, if you can challenge, um, challenge the radiologist to make sure that you know, what you're getting really is high quality. Um, actually, I think that's, that's a really key lesson, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit towards the end as well. Um, so what, what would I advocate? Well, at our institution, we do a coronal T1 um, sequence, and that's really important. That's the, the way that we really assess anatomy. It gives you a good overview. And we do proton density fat saturated images to look for the, um, for the cartilage, for the ligaments. So we do that in all three planes. And we try and keep slice thickness down. And that's what it's all about, really, with us. Um, and that's been the greatest development over the last five years or so with MR of the wrist, it's getting those slices really thin whilst keeping the signal to noise ratio high. The other thing that's been quite important is the advent of 3D volumetric sequences. And I think that if you're not used to looking at those, it's worth asking for them, or at least um, asking why you're not being presented with them. Um, what we tend to do is a, a T2 star, it's a gradient echo um, 3D sequence. The advantage of that being that um, the slices can be very, very thin. So you know, 0.2 to 0.5 millimeters. And these are volumetric contiguous slices. So you can reconstruct the images a bit like you can a CT scan. Um, they're fluid sensitive um, and they are relatively quick. I mean, this is a long sequence, a lot of images, but by doing it in this grid and echo format, it's relatively quick. And that's important. So timing is critically important with MI imaging of the wrist. And that's because, well, it is with all imaging, but with the wrist is important. One, because you are really fighting to justify that MRI scan to start off with. You know, I mean, you'll hear me bang on about um, MRI as a first line investigative tool for um, the query fractures. And I think, you know, you want to be able to do a scaphoid or a wrist protocol in, in less than 15 minutes. Do it fast, you can do lots of them, you can get people through the scanner, you can, you know, you have bargaining power over your, um, over your MR department. So you've got to teach them or help them develop fast techniques. It's also important because the major issue that we have with wrist imaging is movement, okay? And, there are two ways you can position a, a wrist in a scanner, the kind of one that's prone to movement and the other way, okay? So the way there's advocates advocated in all the textbooks is a Superman position. So you put your arm above your head like this, you stretch your arm out into the scanner. The whole point of that being that the wrist sits in the center of the magnetic ball and that produces the more homogenous, um, homogenous image, better signal to noise ratio. The problem is that you need to be a young, fit sportsman without a shoulder problem to achieve that, to keep your hand perfectly still for 15 minutes, even when it's held within a, um, a coil, it, it, it's difficult for some. So um, in fact, what a lot of institutions do first line is plan what you know, I would consider plan B, which is hand, behind, hand by the side, um, a bit like you're just lying in bed with a hand by your side. The hand, of course, is to the edge of the magnetic field, um, and you can lose some fat saturated, um, fat saturation of the images around, around the periphery. You lose some signal to noise ratio, but you don't get movement artifacts. That means you get happy radiographers because you're not repeating the images. And you know, at least you get something worth looking at. Um, so that's good. So the other thing that people always like to talk about with technique is whether to perform all these on 3T scanners. 3T scanners are twice the, twice the magnetic strength, twice the price, and therefore presumably better. But it, and they kind of are. I mean, if you, if a 3T scanner over 1.5, you're doubling the signal to noise ratio. And that's what we're trying to do here. So that's good, right? Because you increase the signal to noise ratio, you double it, you increase the spatial resolution. Um, so the contrast resolution, um, even though you're driving the slices thinner and thinner and thinner, and you're trying to reduce the field of view down as much as possible to increase spatial resolution. And all these things reduce the signal to noise ratio. 
So what you do is you double the magnet size and you can um, play a bit more with that. So 3T is really important for maintaining the signal whilst reducing the signal to noise ratio and increasing the spatial resolution. But what's the problem with 3T? Well, there isn't really much of a problem except that it's competition on the scanner. Um, oh, 3T is faster, that's the other thing. 3T scanners produce faster images, so less movement artifacts. The problem with them is susceptibility artifacts, okay? So if you've got a post-operative patient uh, and there's metal work in there, or even somebody where there's been some instrumentation, you sometimes get tiny, tiny bits of metal left behind, even if you stick a scope in somebody. You see this all the time in the knee. You stick a scope in somebody, you take it out. A year later, there's still a tiny little, you know, bit of metal that's invisible. Even on the scanner, it's invisible, except for the artifact that's produced. So if you've intervened on a patient, it's not always the right thing to do is to do a 3T scan, okay? The most important thing, the bottom line here, is patient positioning and field of view. The third thing on the list, very purposefully the third thing on the list, is whether it's a 3T or 1.5T scan, okay? Because what you're aiming for is comfort, signal to noise ratio, the contrast, and homogeneity, okay? There's a reason why, well, there are a lot of reasons why radiographers like to moan, radiologists like to moan as well, um, but one of them is that, you know, we, we don't want to image more of the body than we have to, because what we're trying to do is reduce the field of view and get better signal to noise. So if you're after a scan of the scaphoid, then we'll just do what we've got on the picture here. Just get the carpal bones. If you want the fingers in, tell us, and we'll include the fingers, but we don't want to image any more than we have to, okay? Um, so this is a stir image. And what you can see on the stir image is it's got fantastic fluid sensitivity. Okay, so that's really good. So we don't actually include the sequence in our, in our package. Um, and that's because, you know, the whole thing was a, you know, driven by time, but, and I don't really miss it, but, but stir imaging is really good for fluid sensitivity. The problem is you got, can you see it's quite grainy? You lose that spatial resolution. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just not, and you lose a bit of the fat saturation sometimes as well. So it's not that, not the prettiest of images, but a lot of people would chuck that in as an extra sequence if you have the time, that stir. But the most important thing I think you guys, and you'll be getting proton density fat saturated images, I'm sure, make sure you've always got a T1 coronal. And if you're not getting these 3D images, I think you should be asking for them now. I think it should be standard. And the other reason it should come standard, and we'll talk about this in the context of scaphoids, is that you can, I believe, or us and we in Oxford believe that you can use it rather like a CT scan if you manipulate the image in the long axis of the seat of the scaphoid, you can use it to assess um, the degree of displacement of the bone. Okay, so it's very useful. So the next question, I suppose, that flows from this is whether or not to give contrast. And you know, there are different ways of doing this. You can um, inject contrast directly into one or, or more joints. Okay, so this is direct MR arthrography, or you can um, give an injection of intravenous uh, gadolinium, and uh, that's so-called uh, indirect arthrography. And we used to do a lot of arthrograms, direct arthrograms, and what used to happen is we'd inject, we'd use ult, um, fluoroscopy to inject three different joints, the DRUJ, the radiocarpal, and the intercarpal joints. And then over the years, we, we realize that it's not actually that helpful. And, and now what we do, if at all, is inject a single compartment. Um, and that's gonna be the wrist, the radiocarpal. And the reason we inject a single compartment is that we're able to provide um, or exert greater tensile sort of pressure within that compartment. And that exposes weaknesses in the, um, you know, in the wall more. So you, if you're really trying to exploit a tiny perforation in the TSC or the scapholunate ligament, you want to pump as much contrast as, po as possible into just one compartment, and it reduces the false um, false negative um, that you get, um, the high false negative rate that you get with multi um, compartment injections. We are moving now to doing these under ultrasound guidance, and it's technically quite straightforward. So that's something that again, you know, we should probably be doing for our patients. Although I have to say the, the, number of, um, the number of requests that we get for these just seems to reduce by the month. Okay, and the question is, does that, does that add any value? Well, I am not sure. I mean, maybe second line adds value. It adds value if you are looking at the cartilage surfaces and it adds value if you think you have a symptomatic, if you're worried about a symptomatic tear of the TFC or the um, proximal carpal intrinsic ligaments. Okay.
So when would we ever think of giving intravenous contrast? Well, not often is the answer. We always get requests for contrast um, scans and, and we very, very rarely, rarely um, you know, do that. I think the main reason nowadays is probably for inflammatory um, arthropathies. So particularly, you know, for screening for inflammatory arthropathy and, you know, in the absence of any erosive change or, on an x-ray, then I think that's a pretty good reason. Um, and this is a 25-year-old um, female patient in this picture here. With, it's a T1 fat-saturated image post-gadolinium. And you can see um, some periarticular um, uh, soft tissue edema and even some bone marrow edema. And we know that these bone marrow edema changes are predictive of um, erosions. And that's very important, um, very important thing to recognize. The other thing I think is infection. So um, if you've got a soft tissue infection and you're trying to establish where, you know, how much of the soft tissue disease is necrotic, how much is an abscess and how much is viable phlegmon, then, um, then contrast again is very helpful. But these cases don't come along that often really. Um, some centers will do dynamic post-contrast imaging, so for bone ischemia. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. There's debates really in the literature about whether dynamic imaging is dynamic contrast imaging is best than routine MRI. In fact, you know, we, we don't believe there's enough added value um, in the context of bone ischemia to, to, to give contrast first line. Um, but I know a lot of people would disagree with that, um, particularly the Swiss. So bones, let's talk about bones first of all. So when we're talking about bone injuries, we're really talking about contusions, and fractures, okay? And there's a difficulty in the language here. So contusions are sometimes called bone bruises, they're called um, trabecular injuries or micro trabecular fractures. And the nomenclature causes a little bit of difficulty, but I think the important thing is that you and your radio radiographer, radiology um, colleagues are all speaking the same, same language. Um, I get asked by um, some of my orthopedic colleagues not to call things micro fractures because the patients often get alarmed. They read the reports and they get alarmed by, um, by them and they think they've got a fracture and they don't really understand that these aren't cortical insults. Um, I think of these things as being sitting on a spectrum. Um, I mean, a, a, bone, um, a bone bruise or a, a contusion is a, is a trabecular injury, right? It's a trabecular injury that doesn't involve the cortices. Um, it's one where, from an imaging definition point of view, we don't see a discrete fracture. If I see a horizontal black line on a T1 fat um, sensitive image like this one, um, this is through the capitate here, but it doesn't involve the, uh, the, the, the cortices, then I'll call it a microtrabecular fracture, acknowledging that there's a continuum between um, trabecular edema, you know, if you really zoom in the microscope, to uh, a tiny trabecular insult, to a trabecular fracture, to a partial fracture, and then partial cortical fracture. But I think um, for, for most people, um, it, it, it is better perhaps, and, and certainly simpler to just differentiate contusion from fracture, okay? And we're, cool, we're not sure, of course, what the, um, what the relevance is really of diagnosing all these bone contusions on MRI. You know, we don't really know how long they take to resolve, um, when, when they're symptomatic and when they're not symptomatic and um, whether we should really be doing anything about them at all. So um, it probably doesn't really matter what we call them as long as we don't cause confusion. So um, anyway, what you should be doing is looking for a discernible fracture. And what that is, is a, a either straight black line on the T1 image or less commonly on the fluid sensitive PD fat sat images, okay? So I'm looking first of all at the, that coronal T1, it's a screening image, that's the first image you should be looking at and looking for black little black lines, okay? Having not seen any of those, I then look at the fluid sensitive images and I look for areas of bone contusion, i.e. bone marrow edema in the context of fracture, uh, in the context of trauma. If I see focal areas of contusion, then I will look for a dark associated black line um, on that fluid sensitive image or go back to the T1 image and look for the line there, okay? And then I might call this a fracture. So, you know, I think the first thing you've got to do is screening view, look at the T1, and then move to the fluid sensitive um, sequences. And remember, just follow the fluid. That's the, um, that's the secret, really. Um, so 
The other reason I put this image up is just to remind you that we see an awful lot of, on MRI, we see an awful lot of capitated fractures, hamate fractures, um, tricuteral fractures. You know, they're not just scaphoid fractures. Scaphoid fractures are more common, but we're seeing huge numbers of other carpal fractures um, now that we are doing the correct imaging. Okay, so what about stress injuries? So these are essentially fatigue fractures, um, and they occur with repetitive stress. Um, in the context of normal bone. So these are described in, and, and, and reported in, in various carpal bones, um, and each one is associated with a particular sport, it seems. Um, and in the scaphoid, we're particularly talking about um, those sports associated with dorsiflexion. So um, things like shot putting um, or gymnastics, particularly with bilateral um, gymnastics. Um, and chronic stress injuries across the distal radial growth plates, also particularly important in the young in the young gymnast. Um, and that's what we mean by gymnast wrists or epiphysiolysis, okay? Because what happens is you get lysis of the, um, along, the, um, along the margin of the, uh, of the physis. So essentially it's a microtrabecular Salter Harris type one fracture um, due to repetitive compressive forces uh, in that distal radial growth plate. And you get some lysis and reabsorption, and you even get some cartilage often just radiating down into the metaphysis, which you can see on the MRI as well. Okay, that's quite a nice feature. We see an awful lot of distal radial stress injuries and uh, distal radial fractures actually in, in, in the clinically suspected scaphoid fracture group. So, what about scaphoid fractures? So, we know from our local data that we miss or we would miss a huge number of these if all we did is perform radiographs, okay? So we would miss about 41% of them. Um, now, those that argue that we are being wasteful of resources by doing MRI scans and all these, um, perhaps don't realize that 35% of the MRI scans we do have a carpal fracture. I and mean, that's a higher hit rate than any of the MRCPs that we do endlessly in our department or, or, or the full spine MRIs requested by, particularly by, by the physios who just request so many, and these full spine MRIs take an hour, 45 minutes to an hour. This scaphoid MRI series takes 10 to 15 minutes, okay? So when your radiology colleagues say, I oh, you know we, we just don't have the capacity to do these scans, then either they don't understand the data or they don't understand um, resource management, okay? So what you need to point out to them in the data is what a, an amazing sort of, um, how much pathology you know, you, you'd be picking up if you did all, these, did all these MRI scans. And that's important, I think. So 13% of the MRI scans have a scaphoid fracture. That's a huge number, okay? And it's not just about the scaphoid fractures, it's about all the associated fractures, all the other carpal fractures, the undiagnosed distal radial fractures. It's about the soft tissue injuries, okay? So we see a huge number of um, associated you know, dorsal and carpal ligament sprains and, and other stuff, which, um, well, we need to work out what the significance are of all those soft tissue injuries in terms of our management, um, management pathways. But these things are helpful to find out, I think. I think they're helpful for the patient as a, as a as an explanation for their pain. Um, it's useful when they're trying to work out what their recovery time should be, um, what their turn, you know, turn sport time you know, ought, ought, ought to be. Um, and I think MRI is also useful for spotting those potential complications early or, or recognizing which fractures that might lead to a complication. Who do you need to really watch out for? Okay, which fractures looking like they're heading towards a non-union or a vascular necrosis? Okay, and we don't, we're not terribly good, I think, at recognizing those, but we're getting better. We're only going to get better if we do the scans. Okay, so um, I think the bottom line here is that MR is particularly well suited for, for, for spotting early complications. And if you think that, you know, 12, is it 12, 13% of scaphoid fractures fail to heal and progress to non-union, I think that's, that's, that's something we probably ought to be looking for. Okay. So the bottom line here is to look for the presence of a fracture line with sclerosis. Okay. So if you see sclerosis on fracture lines, that's um, a well demarcated black line on the T1 images like this one, then that should raise the possibility of non-union the corticated articular margin, not the articular margin, the fracture margin. The other thing you need to look for is little microcystic changes along the periphery of the fracture margin. You see, either of those two things 
then you're suspicious for micro um, micro motion and you're thinking about um, impending non-union and, 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 and a, and a so sort of quicker follow up, so a CT in sort of three to four weeks rather than five to six weeks is, is what you need to be arranging. Okay, in terms of the um, cohort patients that we have, we know quite a lot now about what the associated findings um, are. So, you know, we know, for example, that fractures of the distal radius um, are associated with, you know, with very commonly with carpal fractures and scaphoid fractures are associated with other carpal fractures, you know, lunate fractures in particular. Okay. Um, in terms of the soft tissue findings, like I said, the dorsal and carpal ligaments is, is invariably what's torn. So if this is that easy, if MRI is really that useful and cost effective and quick um, and, and safe, then, then why, why don't we all do it? And that, that's the problem. Um, well, a lot of people do do it, but they don't necessarily do it very quickly and very efficiently. So in our study where we contacted 87 centres, only 11, so 13% had an MRI service directly available from the ED. And when you consider that a short sequence wrist MRI only costs about 70, 72 pounds compared to the cost of a fracture clinic appointment without radiographs already costing 165 pounds. So the financial data is there for you to arm yourself with when you're speaking to your colleagues. You can also show the SMART trial data, which showed um, cost effective, cost savings every three, so three months, six months, one year um, post, um, post fracture. So at the three month mark, there's a 266 pound saving by putting them on the MR, um, um, sorry, uh, 174 pounds at three months and uh, 266 pounds at six months. So a clear cost savings. So if you're interested in spend to save, then this is a bit of a no brain. What you'll then be told is something about MR capacity and radiographer shortages. And these things are, are true. The difficulty is that, yeah, we are short of MR capacity, everyone is. But if you were to sit in my shoes and see how many normal MRI full spines we perform every day, how many MRCPs, how many very um, sort of minimally abnormal MR knees we do, you know, you would think very long and hard before you refused, um, before you you, know, you, you refused uh, or, or didn't request a, um, an MR on your scaphoids. You know, remember how this is a 10 or 15 minute study. It's very, very quick. Um, we get by on seven, 15 minute slots per week for our entire cohort. So this only works if you're very judicious in the way that you examine and select the patients down the scaphoid pathway. But that's, I think, the subject for, for another talk. So let's move on and talk about avascular necrosis. So, you know, we're on the subject now of complications and in the setting of trauma, you know, following a scaphoid fracture, you know, we're really worried about avascular necrosis and, even if there isn't any trauma, then we're, we, you know, we're worried about Kindbox or in the context of the scaphoid and um, Fraser's disease. So what you need to look for is you need to put up that T1 coronal sequence again and look for evidence of avascular necrosis. So you're looking for fats replacement. So loss of the T1 fat signal within the proximal pole of the scaphoid. Okay. And what's important is whether it's diffusely low signal or, or just whether it's a bit patchy. If it's a bit patchy, it's the pattern of the patchiness that's important. Is it proximal? Is it proximal radial? Is it proximal ulnar? Is it diffuse? And also how dark is it? How sclerotic is it? In this example um, by Sarah Zoll, he's a Swiss chap who's done a lot of the work here. He, if it's really, really low signal, really sclerotic and diffuse like this, then this is avascular necrosis. You know, it's pre-collapsed avascular necrosis 100% of the time. That's easy, okay? The problem is you, you do need to look at the fluid sensitive images as well, because if you have a low T1, it will never be this low, but a low T1 um, signal scaphoid, and then you pull up the T2 or the T2 equivalent, we're, we're using PD fat sets, and you see increased fluid signal, then you can't really be that certain. You know, is this an ischemic uh, area or is it necrotic? Is it, or is it just traumatic edema? You know, is a traumatic edema either side of a fracture line you haven't recognised? Um, and this is why um, this chap, Sevzal, advocates, strongly advocates, contrast enhancement, so IV contrast, to really demonstrate what's ischemic, 
what's in the um, you know, what, what's live, what's dead, basically. So um, everybody for a few years started giving IV contrast for these patients. And it probably does mildly increase your sensitivity for, um, for recognizing avascular necrosis. But there have been some recent papers, particularly um, Christian Furman from Zurich, who's shown that the, you know, there's one day paper that showed complete, the complete opposites, that um, actually have a, a higher, um, um, a greater accuracy without giving contrast. So, you know, I think it's more about education about the pattern of the necrosis or pattern of the low signal, I mean, that's, that's most important. Um, in our institution and through most of the UK, we would not give contrast in the first instance. Okay, because we think we can tell the difference in most of most most cases, and then we use contrast as a second line troubleshooter. Okay, so um, yeah, I mean it, it might be interesting to hear from some of you at the end whether you, you routinely give contrast or, or not. And a similar thing true in the lunate. So Kynebox disease um, similarly is a is a type of osteonecrosis that affects the the lunate and it's sort of an uncertain etiology. You know, unlike um, in the in the scaphoids where it's not really uncertain etiology, we, we we think we know it's due to um, a vascular insult due to either um, medication or, or due to um, a micro um, micro trauma to the microvasculature. Um, with the lunate, I think that research hasn't been done. It's still considered. Uh, idiopathic. Um, and, and what's important about it? Well, the first thing to recognize is the, is the pattern of morphology here. So um, this is a, a beautiful example, as, you, as you'd expect. It's diffusely low signal, um, and your eye should instantly be drawn towards the normal um, radial ulna alignment there. And what you should be looking for is a negative variance, a negative ulna variance, okay? If you've got a sort of slightly equivocal case and a negative ulnar variance, then this really does push you towards uh, Kynebox disease, okay? Um, if you think that the negative ulnar variance is present in 78% of patients with Kynebox and 23% of patients with a normal population, it's quite a useful differentiator, okay? Um, in terms of the overall imaging classification, we tend to use a slightly old fashioned um, staging system uh, by Lightman, who talks about stage one being the normal X-ray, but the focal diffuse, the abnormal signal change uh, on MR. When I say focal diffuse, what we're looking for really is more than 50% of the lunate being involved. Okay, and that's to help differentiate it from uh, on a carpal abutment. Okay, so 50% of the lunate involved, and then you want it to be really low signal, and we'll talk about the pattern a bit in a moment, okay? Stage two is when the lunate becomes more sclerotic, more diffusely sclerotic, and you start seeing that sclerotic um, increase in density on the radiographs, okay? So you should be doing X-rays and MRs together. It's not good enough just to do an MR. You always wanna do both, okay? Radiograph and the MR at about the same time, and then you can make a decision. Stage three is where it's easy, when it starts to collapse, and stage four, when you get the degenerative arthrosis, and there are some subtypes there as well. So um, how do we, so in practical terms, how do we help differentiate this from lunate, um, so ulnar lunate impaction syndrome or, or even the lunate microganglia that, um, actually this is more of a problem. People know about ulnar carpal abutment, but what I see more of actually is um, the case where you get stress reactions around tiny microganglia that can occur at the scapholunate and lunotricutural ligament insertions. And you get little microganglia, which aren't well seen on the MR, but certainly on the T1, but may have been seen on the X-ray if you look properly at that. And then on the MR, what you see is loads of bone marrow edema. Um, or you see some sclerotic change. And what it actually is, is, um, is, is bone stress, secondary to the um, insertional sort of endoscopy. So um, just be wary of the microganglia stress reaction uh, effect. In terms of the ulnar lunate um, impaction syndrome, so it's not just about, well, okay, so the first thing is about the ulnar uh, variance. If you've got a positive ulnar variance, okay, then you're really leaning very heavily towards ulnar carpal uh, abutment. If you've got a negative ulnar variance, you're thinking pretty heavily towards Kynebox, okay? Um, the other thing is if you've got a TFC tear, then you're already starting to think there's, there's some, and um, there's micro trauma across that articulation. The third thing, <coughs> excuse me, the third thing is the pattern of the insults on the lunate. So um, the 
kyboxy starts proximally, but at the proximal radial corner, whereas um, ulnocarpal abutment starts at the proximal ulna corner of the lumen. Okay, and it's that pattern that's really important. Okay, and it's perfectly reasonable to say, look, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. There's, you know, it's a little bit patchy. It doesn't really look like it's focused towards the um, ulnar proximal corbal. We're going to repeat the imaging and just repeat it in two months, and then it becomes very clear and focused usually. Okay, so what about, um, um, okay, on a lunate impaction, so he talks about, okay, this is a nice example here. So here we have a slightly positive um, ulna, uh, ulna variant. You've got a large central tear to the TFC. Hopefully you can see my mouse um, arrow here. The TFC has got a large, now remember that um, defects, central defects, the triangular fibrous fibrocartilage complex are very, very common. But if you've got a young patient, with a central defect of, or an, a radial side of defect of the TFC, in the context of, prox, um, of lack of trauma, prox, um, uh, positive on a variant, then you're going to be very suspicious. You're going to be really looking hard at that corner of the lunate, the ulnar corner of the lunate, to look at any signal change. And you're really, at that case, leaning towards ulnar lunate impaction. Okay, so this is a fluid sensitive sequence, and you can see fluid in the DRUJ, a little bit of a cartilage defect, as well as a massive defect in TFC and some bone marrow edema at that ulnar proximal corner. And if you look at the T1, you start seeing a little bit of um, low signal change there as well. Okay, so have a look at the cartilage and have a look at the TFC. Okay, so that brings us nicely onto ligaments. Um, so ligaments, I've, I've resisted temptation to talk too much about anatomy because you're not excellent at anatomy, um, but we tend to think of the intrinsic ligaments and the extrinsic ligaments. And when we're talking about intrinsic ligaments, we are mostly concerned with the scapha lunate and the lunotricrucial ligaments, okay? Um, when we talk about the extrinsic ligaments, we are talking about the pericapsular ligaments, um, and we're talking about the, um, the dorsal, the volar ones, but also those around the DRUJ as well, okay? Um, the volar extrinsic ligaments, remember, are the, are the stronger ones. Um, and actually, although they're much stronger than the dorsal ones, they, and, and, and much more important, actually, functionally, they, they're not the ones that um, we typically see injured um, in, our, in our formal outstretched hand patients. It's, the, it's very much the dorsal intercarpal ligaments, and um, especially around the insertion of the tricuture where, where we see the damage, okay? So let's move on to intrinsic ligaments, they're more interesting. So we're talking about the scaphalunate ligament uh, in particular. And this is a, um, this is a, uh, a scaphalunate um, joint sort of pulled open from anterior. And so this is the, um, the dorsal, uh, dorsal aspect here, and then the proximal aspect here, and then this is the, um, the, the volar aspect separated at the front here. Okay, and what you can see is the, the, volar, the volar ligament um, is sort of fairly small compared to these very strong transverse fibres uh, within the dorsal component. Okay, and then the middle aspect is actually relatively thin as well. It's kind of patchy fibre cartilage, and that's important for one of the MRI pitfalls that I'll um, talk about in a few moments. Okay, so the dorsal and volar bands are true ligaments, okay, but the central bit and the and the proximal central aspects in particular um, are, you know, it's, it's a bundle of fibre cartilage. It looks like a triangle when you look at it on the cranial imaging, um, but it's what you don't see is the lovely kind of ligament um, fibres all lined up perfectly uh, and horizontally, okay. So the, remember the dorsal bands of the scapha lunate is the most important for stability. Um, and what you should be looking for is homogeneous low signal, like with all ligaments, homogeneous low signal, okay, on the MRI, on all sequences. The other two bands, so the, the middle and the volar ligaments, are different for the reason I just said, the different alignment of the, of the fibres, they show more intermediate signal, um, and that's because they're fibrovascular, there's a bit of vascularity there, um, and so you get some, a little bit of high signal can interweave those, um, those fibres. Okay, so what do we what do we see? So um, here is a, this is a beautiful image. It's a um, it's an arthrogram, an MRA. It's a three D um, sequence, uh, and what you can see is the proximal aspect of the central band. 
uh, just across here. Okay, there's also some high signal here, and then there are a few more fibers there. So don't mistake this for being a cleft tear. This is normal fibrovascular uh, tissue. Um, as long as the proximal aspect's intact, then, then that's okay. And then you'd scroll anteriorly and posteriorly to look for the dorsal and the volar bands, and then you change to look at the axial images to again look for those dorsal and volar bands. And this is where the 3D thin, thin slice imaging is so helpful. You know, I think you get spoiled, uh, you know, a year ago, I'd be happy with a one millimeter slice. Now I want it to be 0.2 millimeters. You know, you really, um, in, in most departments, I mean, you get one slice, actual slice lined up between here and here. You need two or three slices to really make a decision across through here, here, and here, okay? So thin slices are key. It's even harder to see the lunar triquetral ligaments if you aren't able to reconstruct your axial slices. Okay, but similarly, you know, you're looking for that proximal, um, uh, the proximal central uh, fibres. Um, and remember, the strongest fibres are the are the volar uh, fibres, and they're the ones that they're strong because they interweave with the adjacent uh, TFC, which you can see here, is, you know, bang next door. And you, you, maybe you can't see so clearly here, but remember, they they are they communicate. It's why the injuries um, when you get an injury to one, you often get an injury to the other. They um, they're, they're cross fibres. Okay, so um, so remember the volar um, component blends with the um, TFC and, and is therefore the strongest. Okay, so what? How do we how do we recognize pathology? So we talk about grade one, grade two, grade three sprains with ligaments, and you know the same thing really applies uh, with with TF with with, 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 the, with the intrinsic ligaments. So a grade one uh, ligament injury is an interstitial injury. So you can see here some. You might recognize some like um, thickening here of the proximal aspects of the scaphalunate ligament. And it should look quite triangular, but this is a little bit bigger than would be considered normal. It's a very subtle injury. Um, and, you know, I'm sure it's of, of, of little, little consequence, but it might explain the patient's pain. The important thing really is to recognize that this isn't, shouldn't be overcalled because of the high signal uh, adjacent to it here, the fibrovascular uh, fibers. The, Grade twos really ought to be detected because those are focal, uh, focal changes. And these are things that, this is the reason we, these grade two tears are the reason that we um, used to so many, excuse me, so many arthrograms, looking for that tiny uh, occult focal perforations uh, through the joint, okay? Um, and you're looking at focal distortion. If you then look at the axial images, you'd find the dorsal and the volar bands were completely intact. If you look at this image over here, this is a grade three. So this is a complete disruption. So the central aspect, central fibers have torn and retracted, and the dorsal and the volar bands have also torn and retracted. As a result, there's abnormal winding, there's scaphalunate dissociation there, the joint. Okay. You can even see the proximal carpal row is like in mal aligned here, and this radiocarpal abutment there. Okay. So let's talk for a moment about um, scaphalunate dissociation. So what happens with any tearing or stretching of the scaphalunate ligament, particularly to the dorsal bands, is the scaphoid, you get scaphoid palmar flexion and lunate dorsiflexion. There's that combination of palmar scaphoflexion and lunate dorsiflexion that, um, uh, that leads to this dizzy deformity. And we're looking for the, that malalignment exceeding 60 degrees seen in the diagram here. Okay, so this is dorsal indicated segment instability um, and can lead to proximal migration of the capitate and early arthropathy. And this is really, um, we're starting to talk about a slack wrist now, so scaphalunate advanced collapse. And this is what we're trying to avoid. If you recognize that dizzy early, you know, you're then able to manage the patients in a way that will avoid a slack wrist. Okay, can't call, talk about slack wrists without talking about the scaphoid fracture non-union uh, equivalent, so the snack wrist. Um, and again, you know, if you, if you miss, if you don't do the MRI scan, you're not going to see the scaphoid fracture. You may fail to recognize the fracture that's impending non-union. You haven't seen the sclerotic fracture margins, the microcystic changes around the edges. They then have an unduly long follow-up. The, um, you end up with a fracture non-union and then God forbid the, uh, the scaphoid non-union advanced collapse, okay? On radiography, we're looking very much for the hump deformity. So the hump deformity is secondary to uh, scaphoid, um, 
fracture mal union, where you get the dolar, dolar angulation of both the proximal and the distal poles. So the, it's the angulated dorsal um, surface of the scaphoid that forms the, the palpable humpback. Okay. So scaphoid uh, lunate advanced collapse. The, the, the issue with this is very much about recognizing it early and um, avoiding the complications. So the, 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 the degree of arthropathy. And you can see here, you've already get, so you've got some um, scaphoid lunate dissociation. You're already getting some dizzy deformity. So this on this one image, the uh, lunate looks very flattened. It's not flattened, it's just rotated. And there's already some um, stress change across the lunate capitate articulation. You can see this microcystic change here. Okay, so this is the key finding, I think, on all of this. You should be looking for that lunate capitate arthrosis. Okay, or capitate lunate arthrosis. Okay, so what's next? So ligaments, um, TFCC, so the triangular fibrocartilage complex um, has a complex anatomy. Okay, so the disc itself, the triangular fibrocartilaginous disc, the TFC, um, is that tiny little triangular thing that sits between the dorsal and the volar radial and the ligaments. Okay, it's important to recognize on the imaging what's ligament and what's disc. Okay, there's also the small little meniscus homologue largely ignore the um, ulnar collateral ligaments, um, which you can see there going from the um, ulnar styloid up to the tricutrum, and the um, ECU tendon sheath as well. Okay. The reason that the it's so important to recognize, differentiate the disc from the ligaments is that the, the peripheral attachment of the TFC to the distal, well, the peripheral attachment, i.e. the, the, the well, let's put it this way. The central attachment of the disc to the radius um, is via this cartilaginous contour here. Whereas at the anterior, the volar and dorsal margins, the ligaments attach directly onto the bone. And this is an important pitfall, okay? So when you're scrolling through the images, you need to be able to recognize ligaments attach onto bone, disc attach onto cartilage. Because I've seen this called too many times where the, as, as, a, as a radial sided tear, where the TFC is seen not to attach directly onto the bone, well, it's not meant to, okay? Um, so another pitfall on the, on, the, on the ulnar side. So the triangular ligament has a, um, a proximal and a distal attachment at the uh, ulnar aspects, okay? So these, you can just about see here, proximal and distal attachment. So these are called the laminates, the proximal and the distal uh, lamina. And the proximal lamina attaches to the ulna fovea down here, and the distal lamina attaches to the, um, to the ulna styloid process. Okay, they blend with the fibrous um, connective tissue of the ECU tendon sheath. Okay, and that's why you often get a communication of fluid between, between the two. Okay, so it's important to recognize for the reason that, can you see the space between the two? you've lost that low signal ligamentous appearance, okay? That's normal, it's a normal space between the two attachments um, and it should be recognized as normal fibrovascular soft tissue rather than an ulnar sided tear, okay? So it's got a name, it's called the um, sub um, subcurrentum, sub subcurrentum. So the um, ligamentum subcurrentum between those two different um, laminae, okay? So just another pitfall. Uh, normal peripheral vascularized, vascularized tissue. Um, oh, let's slide, uh, a slide there. Okay, so the final thing really, I mean, it's to show you this example. So this is a, um, a great big radial sided tear. This is the, the free edge. You should be looking at that free edge of the uh, TFC. Doesn't attach the bone, nor does it attach the cartilage. Okay, there's an associated chondral defect right next to it. You should be looking for those chondral defects. Um, and recognizing um, where that is, and you know, location is important here. Okay, is it radial sided? Is it ulnar sided? Is it um, are the ligaments involved? Okay, um, that's I think where these go wrong. Spotting a TFC tear is pretty easy, but recognizing when it involves the ligaments requires an extra level of care. Okay, and the ulnar sided ones a little bit harder. And the other thing is just beware about these tiny degenerative central perforations that are so frequently. Um, described and you know so so normal actually. Um, okay, let's move on to tendons because it's already um, 
quarter past nine or so. So um, another pitfall we're looking at tendons is the magic angle artifact. Okay, so if you haven't heard of magic angle artifact, then it's really important with some sort of longitudinal low signal um, structures. So we're talking about tendons mainly. Um, and anything that runs at 55 degrees to the angle of the um, what we call B0, which is the, the magnetic, um, the center of the ball, essentially, um, the Z axis of, of the stand. Um, anything that lies 55 degrees away from that um, can suffer the, the, this, this artifact, okay? So if you imagine this, is, this patient had, his, had their hand, you can tell in the Superman position, so the middle finger facing directly down the ball, um, well, actually, it can't be like that. It must be more like little finger toward down the direction of the ball. 55 degrees, you've got this um, um, four-finger flexor tendon that appears to disappear, okay? So this is your magic angle artifact. The way to be sure is to look at other sequences. So this only happens on short T images. So we're talking about T, uh, T1, proton density images. If you have a, um, a 3D sequence, a creative deco sequence, then um, particularly the axles, then you should be able to just follow that um, tendon along nicely. Okay, so let's cover a little bit of pathology. So with the tendons, we, we're really interested in recognizing um, tendinosis, tenosynovitis, and tears, so partial tears, complete tears. Um, and it's not always as beautiful as this example here with flexor tenosynovitis and a patient with, um, ends up having uh, had rheumatoid arthritis, also a bit of synovitis in the DLUJ there. Um, uh, this is perhaps a better example. Um, this is a 25 year old with carpal tunnel syndrome, um, and she had um, really severe um, flexor tenosynovitis. And you see the effect on the, um, on the median nerve here. And you can see really with the short axis imaging how beautiful the dorsal and the volar uh, scapholunate um, and lunar trichotral uh, ligaments look. Really easy. Okay, the main thing really with tendinosis is to look for thickening of the tendon and abnormal signal. And just be very wary about looking for split tears. So we love looking for split horizontal longitudinal split tears, particularly the ECU tendon, but these can be a normal variant. And you see some of these tendons here have little sort of what might be described as little sort of slits through them. But you really have to follow them through and back and just window the imaging a little bit because they're terribly overcalls these things. Okay. The other thing is, is just to remember um, infection as a differential. I mean, this is really something I tell radiologists. Just remember, you know, it's not always an inflammatory or a mechanical cause. Just remember when it's that gross um, infection. Okay. Um, so this is quite a gross cause of a um, stenosing tenosynovitis. And you can see that beautifully in the uh, coronal image as well. It's an effective cause. Okay. So this is a nice example of the uh, tendon tear that I talked about. So this is an ECU tendon te um, uh, te uh, tendinosis with longitudinal split tear. The tear is extended through the subsheath, the, 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 the tenosynovium and the subsheath of the tendon, and there's lots of peritendinous edema. Okay, um, so that's something worth looking for. So it's the first tendon, the first extensor tendon I look for in any, you know, we do an awful lot of rheumatology imaging. This, you know, it's ECU, ECU, ECU. That's the first thing, you know, you should be looking for, really. Okay. Um, so tendon attenuation. Remember, tendons should be low signal on all sequences. Okay, they're really easy. Low signal on all sequences. Okay. So what about complete tears? So the first thing is to make sure that you haven't fallen for the magic artifact trick, and then make sure you look at everything on at least two different planes. So look at the coronal, but also look at the axials and follow them through. And this was a um, flex carpi radialis tendon tear. Um, and you can just sort of see that there. So um, I think this patient had rheumatoids. And just what you're looking for is the retracted margins, okay? I think the other thing I'd say about these is I would always perform an ultrasound. I would do ultrasound first line, and if I saw an MRI scan, I would bring them back and do an ultrasound a second line. But you know, ideally, you really want the ultrasound first line. It's much easier on ultrasound. You can do dynamic imaging. You can really follow the tendon. You know, track the tendons up the arm. You can um, intervene. You know, if you need to while they're there. You can so sort of look at everything else and sort of do dynamic imaging as well. So. I, I'd really advocate ultrasound, certainly in the European context, we would always favour ultrasound over MR in the first instance. We're just better, I think. It's, we do many more ultrasounds than we do MRIs for the tendons, and we're better at it, I think. Um, 
Okay. Some people would advocate, again, um, contrast enhanced imaging for tenosynovitis. Again, they're looking for inflammatory um, and effective causes. I think it's unnecessary. You know, I think when you've got a, a clinical picture to curve a tenosynovitis, you do an MRI scan, you see tendinosis, you see tenosynovitis, you see peritendinous edema here around the first extensive compartment, you've got a diagnosis, okay? You really don't need to be giving contrast. In fact, you probably don't need to be doing an MRI full stop, do you? I think an ultrasound scan would suffice in most cases. I would rather do an ultrasound scan um, because then it allows me to follow the tendon up higher up the arm uh, and the muscle. It then allows me to do an injection if, if, if that's um, clinically appropriate, okay? Um, sometimes, you know, it's not that clear clinically and we do that more to fuse that, that sort of wider field of view test, the MRI scan in the first instance and we get these kind of pictures. Okay, so just remember that um, the tendon sheath can be grossly thickened. The, it's a bit different to, I mean, when we're looking at ankle MRIs, um, I'm always telling people, you know, trying to describe how much fluid is abnormal. And it's difficult because it depends on what tendon you're looking at. But with the wrist, all tendon fluid is abnormal. As in, of course it's not, we all have tendon fluids, but tendon sheath fluids. But if you're seeing circumferential fluid around a tendon in the wrist, it's abnormal, okay? So, you know, you might see a tiny bit of high signal up here, um, you know, in this uh, extensor digitorum, but it's not really circumferential around any tendon slip. This is circumferential, so that's abnormal. Okay, so other causes of, uh, uh, of tenosynovitis, um, for them to mention intersection syndrome. And let's differentiate proximal intersection syndrome from distal intersection syndrome, okay? And we're talking about overuse injury, so repetitive extension, particularly rowers. We get a lot of rowers and kayakers in Oxford. And this is, these, you know, these are two a penny, okay? So this is um, uh, an abnormality of the first and second uh, extensive compartments. Um, and it's, you know, it's particularly the tenosynovitis of the third, um, sorry, of the, of the second, as it overlies the first, okay? So this is the second uh, extensive tendon here with the tenosynovitis, as it's, you know, Overlying, overlying the first. And you get peritendinous edema, um, and then you should be looking hard for that intratendinous edema as well, because if it's tendinotic, then that might predispose a tear, okay? And then you need to manage the patient a bit differently, don't you? So protect that tendon. So really, when you see tenosynovitis, make sure that you're also looking for signs of tendon damage. We're also not gonna do an injection if there's any ten, um, intrinsic tendinosis. Okay, and differentiate this from distal, um, distal intersection syndrome. So this is a tenosynovitis of, um, of the um, uh, extensor pollicis longus, so the third extensor compartment as it passes over, over the second. Um, and it's a bit more subtle, so here we are. So this is the third one here, and these are the second tendons here, okay? So this is the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis, and extensor pollicis longus has lost its normal low signal. That's because it's tendinotic, okay? So tendinotic should be low signal, it's not. Okay, not only is it tendinotic, but it's got a rim of high signal around it, and so have the underlying second um, extensor tendons. And remember that there is usually, um, practically always, a tendon sheath communication between the EPL and the ECIL, ECRB tendon sheath. So when you get tenosynovitis in one, you get tenosynovitis in two, well, all three really. So um, that's why it's relatively easy to spot, okay? So um, you should get tenosynovitis across the, um, the whole uh, complex there. Okay, I'm very wide, I'm running over time and it's got three minutes for, for half past mark. So um, I will come to an end, I think, in a moment. What I really wanna say about nerves, we'll just talk about the median nerve, is that ultrasound is more useful than MR for looking at the uh, median nerve. We have all sorts of, um, of uh, dimensions, of um, the median nerve before and in the carpal tunnel that are very, very helpful. Um, some of which are true on MRI and some of which aren't. But certainly in the UK setting, most radiologists are better at taking these, doing these measurements on ultrasound because we do that the whole time, okay? And what we're looking for particularly is not so much thinning of the nerve in the carpal tunnel, but proximal widening of the nerve, proximal thickening of the nerve. That's the key feature. Okay, and we're also, this is the median nerve here, and we're looking for underlying causes. So on MRI, we'd be looking for ganglia, uh, soft tissue masses, tenosynovitis, all these things. We'd also be looking for anatomical variants. Okay, so I quite often see um, 
bifid median nerves or you know abnormal palmaris longus or something like that there's so many anatomical variants around the wrist okay but i would advocate ultrasounds nerve conduction studies these things in the first instance what i would use mri is for post-operative patients because these are quite hard on ultrasound and MR is very useful for looking at the retinac limb. Um, so this is a nice example of a good post-operative outcome and a widely, separate, uh, widely separated um, flexor retinac limb between here and here. And this is what you want. And you want volar migration of the, um, of the median nerve. Okay, so this is good. This is not so good. So this patient had um, ongoing symptoms after her carpal tunnel release. Um, and she had... Um, so insufficient distal release. And you can see actually still, this is very um, distal in the canal, there's a thickened retinaculum, and the median nerve here um, looks a bit sort of flattened, but the point is that it's not, hasn't been displaced. The median nerve should have displaced if the retinaculum was sufficiently released, and that this one hasn't. And the um, distal retinaculum is intact and, and looks thickened, okay? So it's an insufficient distal release, okay? Um, other causes, okay, so this is um, the ulnar nerve of Guillaume's canal, but it doesn't matter. This is a lipoma, um, but that's important. Every now and again, we see little lipomas causing median or ulnar nerve uh, entrapment, and it's not always due to, um, you know, repetitive uh, microtrauma. Okay, we see an awful lot of other sorts of mass sort of lipomas, a lot of ganglia, um, most of which don't matter. And I'd much rather see these things on ultrasound because I can stick a needle in and stick a little bit of aspirate and stick a little bit of steroid in while I'm at it. And I, that just feels like a more useful thing to do. Um, we every now and again see an anatomical um, variant mimicking a soft tissue mass. And this is quite a nice one. So this is a, a palmaris, um, uh, an accessory palmaris uh, longus here. Okay, and we see actually quite quite a lot of these. Okay, the palmaris longus is is, is highly variable. You've got the um, the duplicated versions. You've got the digastric, the two muscle bellies. Um, you've got the ones that are entirely muscular, like this one, um, and then you've got the bits where the tendon is proximal and the muscular aspect is, is distal. Um, the other one that we occasionally see, much rarer, on the extensor side, is the um, extensor distorum brevis uh, ma uh, manus. Okay, which mimics a um, carpal boss, uh, usually sits over that um, second uh, metacarpal head. Um, pretty, pretty rare, but basically it's just an accessory muscle over the dorsum of the hand. Much easier, I think, on ultrasound to recognize it because you can just follow the ends forwards and back and do a dynamic examination and you can see the tendon fibers. I can't see the individual tendon fibers on MRI. I can just see that it's low signal. And I can see where it's coming from, where it goes. Ultrasound, you can see the individual tendon fibers. Um, I think on MRI, what you really just got to do is make sure that it's, it's low signal on all sequences. Um, and you got to just sort of see, see where it goes um, approximately and, and distally. Okay. So my take-home point is really, so first of all, make sure that you're getting a good deal. So make sure that the reports that you're reading are based on satisfactory data, i.e. you're getting, you know, you'll all be um, getting sort of T1 and 3PD fat cells, but you might not all be getting um, 3T, 3T volumetric sequences. And that's important because, and you should be happy with playing with it. So when you get your 3D volumetric sequence on packs, usually with just one click of a button, you can realign the scaphoids on the long axis, assess um, displacement, um, turn the hook of the hamate around and see whether there's any malalignment leaning against the, uh, the ulnar nerve, for example. Really, really useful to be able to manipulate the images like you probably used to with CT scans. Second thing is to make sure that you're speaking the same language as the radiologists you work with. So, you know, I, you know if they're using classifications and um, terminologies which aren't the same sort of ones that you're using, then, you know, then they're wrong, aren't they? You know, the whole point of communication is to speak the language of the, uh, of, of the audience. So just make sure, just inform them. And really, I just love to hear from surgeons. You know, we love it. I love it when the doors, um, someone knocks on the door and says, in your reports, can you please say this, this, this? You know, it's, it's great. It makes me better at my job. I love it. Um, remember, MRI for trauma is a must. Absolutely must. X-ray and MRI, okay? Um, it's not good enough just to x-ray, it's not good enough just to CT. So for scaphoids, carpal fractures, get that MRI scan. It's all about the barriers for change, all about communication. The data is out there, okay? And remember ultrasound first, actually, for soft tissue masses and tendons.
அவங்களுக்கு தான் 